Dr. Myers is going to talk about, well, back to medical things, but we're actually zero in on the optic nerve. Dr. Jonathan Myers. Hi, good morning. First, I want to say how great it is to see all of you here. This conference is one of the most exciting conferences for me each year. Uh, for all of us on the glaucoma department, the staff, the volunteer workers, everyone, you know, glaucoma is the most exciting and uh, uh, passionate aspect of our lives often. And so we're so enthused often to see all of you who for various reasons have found the time on a sunny Saturday to spend time with us talking more about glaucoma. I want to first start off with a question that came up earlier. Uh, someone from the audience asked Mike Pro if color, the color of the eyes, affected uh, your chance of getting glaucoma. And Mike said there really haven't been good studies on this. And then he and I were talking after his talk about that question, because it's a good question. And we looked on the computer together, and we found one study in 2006 by, from uh, Germany. And the short answer is no, iris color doesn't affect your chance of getting glaucoma. It's actually a more complicated thing about iris color and glaucoma, because some glaucomas do affect eye color. Some eye drops affect eye color. Some gl surgical glaucoma treatments can affect eye color. Uh, and eye color may predict how you respond to certain glaucoma medications and surgeries. But in terms of the underlying question, does your eye color predict whether you're more likely to get glaucoma? In general, for a Caucasian population and a Western African uh, American population, pretty much no is, is probably the answer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the optic nerve and glaucoma. And some of this has already been touched on. Eddie Amanari this morning gave a great talk about the anatomy of the eye. I'm going to just reinforce some of what he said. Maybe not. Um, it's a short talk. So uh, here, of course, is the brain. You can see that the eyes really come off a stalk from the brain, right from the center of the brain almost, to the eyeball. And embryologically, as we all develop, you know, as an embryo, as a fetus, this is actually how your eye grows out. So the eye is really an extension of the brain. And of course, as he said, the optic nerve is the television cable between the camera of the eye and the brain. So the nerve goes back to something called the laryngeal nucleus, which breaks up the nerve fibers to left and right and sends it to the occipital cortex, the visual cortex, where you can really perceive images and do a lot of higher order processing. This is a real patient, an MRI, you know, a head scan. And we're looking sort of from the patient's feet up towards their nose, center of the brain, pituitary is right around here. And you can easily make out the two eyeballs. The dark spot here and here, that's the lens in the eye. And the straight stripes here and here are the optic nerves. And they come together here at the uh, chiasm and then go back, as I said, to the cortex. So that shows you how we can study the optic nerve in living people with a high degree of resolution. Uh, glaucoma doesn't tend to affect the appearance of the optic nerve on MRI because we're looking at much smaller changes than gross structural changes. So here's the optic nerve again. So as Eddie said, the optic nerve is not a large structure. It's about a millimeter and a half to two millimeters in diameter. So that's about a tenth of an inch, even less. So it's a small structure to look at. That's why we're always using the microscope and taking out magnifying glasses to look at the back of your eye. And this shows you what the head of the optic nerve looks like. Again, as he said, there are about a million neurons packed into the bundle of the optic nerve. Uh, early in development, it's actually a little bit more, and then it thins out a little bit right around the time of birth. And then we actually lose neurons every year just as a natural process of aging, which for most of us, we can spare them. But if you have glaucoma and you've already lost most of your optic nerve, that age-related decline in the optic nerve may actually be of some significance. So here's a patient's optic nerve. You can see the blood vessels. The darker blood vessels are the veins, and the brighter, lighter ones are the arteries. Here's the nerve. This is a smallish nerve. It's, ju it's just under a millimeter and a half in real life. And this brighter area in the center is a dimple we call the cup. So the cup is like the hole in the donut. And in glaucoma, the cup gets bigger as the nerve dies from the inside out. And here you see another optic nerve. You might want to turn the lights down a little bit if possible. Another optic nerve that's a little larger, and it has a larger cup. 
And here's the tricky part. Is that a larger cup because this is how the patient was built? Or is this a larger cup because this is the beginning of glaucoma causing death of the optic nerve from the inside out as the donut gets eaten from the inside out? What would make all of our lives easier as glaucoma specialists is if everyone carried around in their back pocket a picture of their optic nerve from when they were 20 years old. Because then you could just pull that picture out and I'll be able to say, you know what, your nerve was always this way. You don't have glaucoma. You just have a big nerve. But no one carries those around. And so that's why sometimes your doctor, when you say, do I have glaucoma? They may say, well, you're a suspect. Your nerve is a little suspicious, but I'm not sure. And that's a good thing. As long as we're not sure, that probably means you're doing okay. Hmm. I'm not doing great with this clicker. Here's another optic nerve. So this nerve, I can tell you, definitely has glaucoma. And someone else actually showed this same nerve earlier, as many of you probably picked up, because it's such a good example. Here's the nerve, and the cup is very large. So that's sus very suspicious. But see how the cup extends asymmetrically down here, something we call a notch? It's more of a keyhole than a round circle for the cup. Well, that notch, that almost always means glaucoma. And this next one here, this shows an optic nerve where there's almost all cup and there's only a little bit of rim here. This here isn't actually a rim. That just happens that the pigment that covers the uh, sclera on the inside, the choroid, the retinal pigment epithelium, has pulled back from the edge of the rim of the, cu of the cup and the optic nerve. So there's almost no nerve tissue left. So this person has lost easily 95% of the neurons in their optic nerve. So that march that we just took, those four, that's sort of perfectly normal, probably normal, not normal, and the game's almost over. And that comprises the whole spectrum almost of glaucoma. So when your eye doctor is looking at your optic nerve, that's what is on his or her mind looking to see, are there clues that this is glaucoma? Are there clues that this looks a little worse than it looked last year? And in their mind, they're going through a list of things I won't read through here, there are different aspects of the nerve that may indicate glaucoma or worsening glaucoma. There's an old adage, you only, you only uh, see what you look for, you only look for what you know. So it helps to have in your mind what it is that you're looking for. Now this optic nerve has glaucoma. You can see it has a large cup. But look at this red spot here. That's an optic nerve hemorrhage. So in, in patients with glaucoma, you can get little spots of blood on the optic nerve. And those spots of blood are very small. You know, this is only probably 20, 30 microns across. But people who get these recurrently are more likely to get worse from glaucoma than people who don't get this hemorrhages. So if your doctor says to you, you know, I see a little spot of blood on your optic nerve, they may be talking about something like this. And that may make them more concerned that you may be at greater risk of getting worse. And they may choose to either watch you more closely or intensify treatment. But this spot will go away in a couple weeks or a month, and it doesn't always affect the vision at all. It's just a risk factor for worsening. Here you see an optic nerve that has a notch down below, and you can see all the blood vessels. Well, look here. You see that little red spot? That's also a disc hemorrhage, that little red spot there. And so that's why your, optic, your doctor may look longer than you would like with that bright light on the back of the nerve, because picking up these little details takes time. This nerve doesn't look so bad, but then when you look closely, you can see there's a notch there too. And this is just another optic nerve. It's a stereo photograph. We used to take a lot of stereo photographs so we could use those Walt Disney viewers and get a three-dimensional image of the optic nerve, which is another way to help discern the cup from the rest of the rim. And many of you are already pointing, I'm sure, out the disc hemorrhage here. These can mimic little blood vessels, and until you get in the habit, they can be easy to miss. The optic nerve evaluation remains the best way for us to diagnose glaucoma. If you're actually trying to decide if someone has glaucoma, it's a much more important tool than a visual field test or uh, intraocular pressure. However, as I think I may have shown already, it's not always simple. It takes time. And that's why they've created automated machines that, uses, that use lasers and computers to try to quantify aspects of the optic nerve and make it easier for clinicians to identify glaucoma and to identify if glaucoma is getting worse. And these are the three biggest machines that have been out there, the HRT, GDX, and OCT. And over the last five years, the OCT has become increasingly dominant 
in terms of what many or most clinicians are using to look at the optic nerve. So here's an example of a patient that a physician saw, and they have asymmetric optic nerves. This optic nerve is a little smaller than this optic nerve. You can see that the cup in this optic nerve is a little smaller than the cup in that optic nerve. And larger nerves often have larger cups, not because they have glaucoma, but just because they're larger. Well, this is an OCT, optical coherence tomography, of a patient with asymmetric nerves. You can see this nerve as a, here's the nerve, blood vessels are the lines. The machine helps us out by outlining in red the cup in both eyes. And you can see it then shows the cup in light gray as opposed to the rim tissue in dark gray. You can see the asymmetry in the size of the cup between the two eyes. But the machine makes our lives a little easier. It shows us the actual area, the size of each optic nerve, 2.09 versus 2.44 square millimeters. Okay? These are not big things. But the difference of 2.09 to 2.44 is actually quite significant. My point here is that these quantitative evaluations help us to understand in greater detail the difference in the anatomy. You also notice there are a lot of green things on this scan. They try to make it simple for us country doctors. Green is good, red is bad. So if on your scan everything is green, there's a good chance the machine thinks that you're normal, and that means there's a good chance that your optic nerves really are normal. So although this nerve has a larger cup, all these green segments means it falls within what the machine considers the normal parameters. This is just another angle, another image of the retina and the nerve fibers as they course across the retina, and it looks at the thickness of those nerve fibers. I want to show you how when it looks at the thickness of the retina, it can break down the 10 layers of the retina very easily. This is what happens if you look at an eye under a light microscope in a laboratory in pathology. You can see all these different types of cells that make up the center of your retina. Look how close we are now with non-invasive measurements with scanning laser technology in the office and living patients. And this greater detail that we have now to look at patients' eyes continues to evolve, and we hope that will make it easier and easier to tell, is this glaucoma, is this getting worse? The problem is that these technologies are not infallible. So this is the same patient, the same eye, on the same day, in the same location of the eye, imaged with four different machines. Two of them made by the same company, different uh, technologies, and then two others made by a different company. And although there's a great similarity, I think it's fairly obvious to all of us that these don't look exactly the same. And so if you see one doctor and he has one type of machine, and you see another doctor who has a different type of machine, those results are not going to be identical. And this is troubling for patients, but it's the nature of the eye, the nature of the machines. So if you use these machines to detect glaucoma, sensitivity, how well it detects it, specificity, how well it can say this is not glaucoma, so about 85-90%. In fact, if you take pictures of the optic nerve, you can get about the same numbers. So a clinician like Dr. Spade, the true expert in the optic nerve, can pick up glaucoma very well from photographs. But that takes a lot of work, and not everyone has Dr. Spade sitting in the back room to help them out. So for these people, sometimes these machines can really help out. Now again, these machines are not all knowing or perfect. And so if you take 41 patients with glaucoma and you image them with these three different technologies, you will find that one of the technologies will find every one of the 41 patients who has glaucoma. However, in this Venn diagram, you can see that only 17 of 41 patients did all three of the machines agree this was glaucoma. So again, if you go to a doctor with an OCT, you may be told, I have glaucoma. But if you go to a doctor with an HRT, they may say, you know, your scan doesn't quite show you have glaucoma. You follow? So again, different technologies measure different things, and they're not always going to agree. And that is just the nature of the uncertain aspects of clinical medicine. This is just a second study more recently that showed pretty much the same thing, that these machines often but don't always agree. The other thing is, it's not easy to get good pictures on the machines. Uh, this, uh, Dr. Medeiros, he's out in California, one of the leading labs in the world for doing imaging with these uh, technologies. And they looked at about 100 patients with these three different technologies. And this, these are the numbers of patients that they could not adequately image, 24, 29, 15. 
they could not get adequate images. Sometimes a patient comes to me from our technicians and I look at the scan and I say, you know what, I really can't make much out of this scan. The patient is disappointed. I'm disappointed too, but the thing to understand is that may be because that day your eye was a little too dry. That may be because maybe you had a little extra caffeine and you're not able to hold quite as perfectly still as usual. Maybe you have a bit of a cataract and that makes it harder for you to see out, makes it harder for the machine to see in. There are a lot of good reasons other than the technician wasn't trying hard enough. There are a lot of good reasons why on a given day you can't get an image. Now, some of those reasons may vary from day to day, like how dry your eye is. So on a different day, we may get a good image, but don't be too depressed if some days we can't. What about the issue, I've mainly been talking about diagnosis glaucoma, what about the issue of whether you're getting worse? Well, here's a study about patients followed 100 patients, essentially, or 100 eyes, with over 1,000 tests among these 100 patients. So on average, each patient had about 10 of each of these tests, visual fields and then optic nerve measures with that OCT. And these diagrams, the Venn diagram, tells us how many of the patients seem to be getting worse. So out of 100 patients, 25 of them only got worse by the visual field. And there were nine of them that only got worse on this OCT measure and six that only got worse on this OCT measure. And there is one patient out of 100 over this, in this study that got worse on all three. So this is another point. We all take visual fields as patients. We all have OCTs or other optic nerve measures. Sometimes your doctor may say, you know, your visual field looks a little worse. And you might reasonably ask, well, does it look like I'm getting worse when you look at the nerve or when you get the OCT? And the doctor might say, no, but I'm still worried you're getting worse. Or vice versa, maybe the OCT is worse, but the visual field isn't. So sometimes a person can have what we call progression, worsening of the glaucoma, that first shows up on just one of these measures. Now, given time, it will show up on the other measures, but your physician may not be comfortable waiting to be certain and allowing more damage to occur in the interim. Before I close out with mostly just a couple examples, here's an example of a patient that maybe I'm not, I don't have it large enough on the screen, but has one very small nerve and one larger nerve. And this is a spectralis, another type of OCT. So although this nerve looks very anomalous, and near sight people often have anomalous nerves that look like glaucoma, you can see that in general, these quadrants, these different areas of the nerve, the machine says is normal. You see here how it's red? That's because this area the machine thought was abnormal. The patient wasn't actually abnormal. What happened here is the machine had trouble when it used its computer algorithm to try to discern this layer of the retina versus the other layers sort of couldn't find it. So it was a failure of the imaging algorithm. It wasn't actually that the patient has a problem. Here's another example. So this looks like a seismograph from a terrible earthquake. Well, that's not how patients look. This is an example of a bad scan. Not because anyone wasn't trying, but just the machine couldn't identify the tissue, and it got these spiky numbers, which essentially convey no useful information for the diagnosis of glaucoma. And this other patient with slightly asymmetric nerves, one nerve is normal, but the other nerve seems to be having some areas of potential thinning that could be the beginning of glaucoma. And that's why it's showing up red here, meaning that the nerve fiber is not as thick in that area as the machine expects. Here's a patient that I have helped to follow, a young woman nearsighted with maximum pressure of only 22, not particularly high, and because she's nearsighted, she has nearsight anomalous nerves. And you can see in this area and this area, the machine thinks that she may have thinning of the bottom part of her nerve, cupping in that area, loss of the nerve fiber layer. Well, what the machines allow you to do is to quantify and follow over time. Scan one, scan two, look at scan three. See this little red area? That red area is alerting me, the clinician, that in that area, the machine thinks she's lost about 10 microns of tissue. Well, 10 microns, that is not a lot of tissue. That's about two red blood cells stacked end to end, okay? So it helps to pick up very early change, whereas the left eye doesn't show any red, doesn't show any progression. So this was one of the first tip-offs that this patient actually had glaucoma and was getting worse and needed treatment. At the time, I think I have her visual field here, and this just is more sub-analysis allowing me to look for change and pointing out the numbers that matter. But at this time, she had almost no visual field loss. And in fact, in the eye that was getting worse, that's almost a perfect visual field. 
Actually, it's the other eye that looks stable that on the visual field is starting to show possibly some change. So this, again, is to emphasize that just because you get an OCT, uh, the RNFL thickness is an OCT measure, doesn't mean that you, can't, you don't get to have your visual field. In this study, about a third of patients got worse first on the OCT. A third got worse, or a little bit more, first on the field. And about a third got worse by both at the same time. So optic nerve imaging, definitely helpful. Helps clinicians not to miss things that on routine exam can be hard to pick up because they're so small and so subtle. Helps look for, for change over time. Interpreting these scans actually is, is, requires as much expertise as interpreting the optic nerve evaluation itself because the scans are full of artifacts and other details that may really impact the uh, understanding of what it shows. And again, to really know if you're getting worse, sometimes the scan's enough, but in most times, your clinician's going to have to put the scan results in context of what's happening with your pressure, what's happening with your visual field, what's happening when your clinician is actually looking at the optic nerve. So although these machines have helped us, they have not replaced good old-fashioned clinical medicine or visual fields. So thank you very much. Really, again, a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you.